go. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Kevin. Thank you for others that have joined me on Zoom here for the Reasonable Faith Adelaide chapter. Uh, the topic for tonight is Bible contradictions. When I was given this topic at oh, the beginning of this year, I must confess I really uh, was daunted by the scope of what I was supposed to do. Where do I start? Do we create our own uh, straw man so we have a head start on rebuttal? Or do we take on arguments from Bible sceptics and thus make a defence against their accusations? And surely the latter is the more rigorous and honest approach. Uh, but which sceptics? And that's where I am very grateful uh, to um, Laurie Eddy, um, past president of the sceptics here in Adelaide, and um, because he sent this book a few months ago to Kevin, the Bible handbook, and that was what I really needed, something that would scope what I was to address. I'm sure there are other uh, contradictions out there that people might know of, uh, but at least I have this book and I'm about to share what the book itself declares its aim is. And you'll see that I think this is a good starting point if we're going to talk about Bible contradictions. Right, the Bible handbook itself, if you look at the chapters, uh, you'll see, in fact, this edition here is, I think, the 10th uh, edition, 1953, uh, and includes, and these are the, the different sections in it, Bible contradictions, which is that, that part of the book which I'm going to address, then it goes on to Bible absurdities, Bible atrocities, unfulfilled prophecies and broken promises, Bible immoralities, indecencies and obscenities. Uh, Kevin has a soft copy, so if you wish to get hold of it, um, then please check with Kevin. Uh, under Bible contradictions, though, they had four subdivisions, Old Testament, historical, etc., New Testament, divine attributes, and then miscellaneous addenda. So that's all I'm going to focus on. Indeed, in order to limit myself to the hour that we have tonight, I've probably only taken about 30 or 40% of the contradictions published under that sub, under that particular section there. Um, I tried to be objective. I try not to pick the easy ones. Um, normally, I would pick the first out of each of those subsections and then randomly pick others. Uh, so, yes, if you do want to look at the other contradictions, you'll have to ask Kevin to send you um, the other. Uh, in fact, I might even have a copy myself so you can go and look at the others. But we've got what we've got. We've got about an hour to try and address these. Now I'm going to see what the book, its handbook itself, said about itself in its forward. Our Bible handbook celebrated its diamond jubilee in 1948. First issued in 1888, it has now survived the storms of religious controversy and continues to carry devastation into the ranks of Christian bibliolators, I'm not very good at that, without receiving any adequate answer. As G.W. Foote, the editor of the Free Thinker, aptly observed in the course of his preface up to the first edition in 1888, the anti-Christian controversialist has only to open our handbook and in five minutes, he will be able to advance more arguments against the Bible than his opponent will be able to answer in a lifetime. Uh, you, you can hear me emphasising the points, but there's some very strong claims in this uh, forward here. And then a preface as well. The Bible is a volume of miscellaneous character. It was written by many authors, some of whose names are known and others unknown. Hence the necessity for this Bible handbook, which is chiefly designed for free thinkers, but should also be service to inquiring Christians. And the preface continues, not the best, but the worst things in the Bible are selected. So I was trying to be objective. They're not being trying to be objective. It's self-contradictions, it's absurdities, it's immoralities, it's indecencies, and it's brutalities. Unquestionably, it would be grossly unfair to disavow any uh, disavow an ordinary book in this way. One would not so treat Shakespeare or any other great classic, either of modern times or of antiquity. It's only the Bible that is to be subject to this. But the Bible is not an ordinary book. 
It is stamped as God's word by the Act of Parliament. It is forced into the hands of children in our private and public schools. It is used as a kind of fetish for swearing up in our courts of law and our houses of legislation. So that's uh, their preface to what this book is about. I might just pause briefly there. Some of you might know that I served four years on one of the local city councillors here in Adelaide. And it was my great privilege during that time to attend about 30 uh, citizenship ceremonies. Uh, most citizenship ceremonies in Australia are conducted by the local mayor or her deputy, his or her deputy. And as people come to swear their allegiance to um, Australia to become a citizen, they are given a choice these days. They can choose to swear before God, doesn't have to say which God it is, or they can make an affirmation which has no mention of God. And can I say in the 30 or so citizenship ceremonies that I attended, without fail, at least or around about 80% of the people without any compulsion chose to swear by God. This is now modern secular society. 80% chose to swear by God. The other 20%, I'm sad to say, were largely of British heritage. It's probably a comment then that it is Western Europe and Britain that has this secular bent that will not, uh, not acknowledge any God. But for the rest of the world, 80%, as far as I was observing anyway, they still prefer to swear by God. So whatever that uh, book said at this particular time, uh, today, uh, people are making a choice and 80% of them or thereabouts are swearing by God. And some quick abbreviations, most of you would know these. Uh, you, they do appear in the tables. We're gonna get into tables and I'm sorry, this is probably likely to be a little bit tedious uh, and I'll try not to make it too long as we go through the tables, but that's how this book is presented, the, the Bible handle. We're going to talk about the authorised version of the Bible, commonly known as the King James Version, published in 1611. Uh, they also, the authors of this uh, Bible handbook, also do in fact quote the revised version that was published in 1885. I'll then talk about the Derby version. I looked up on my phone app uh, for the Bible and Derby was there. I know a little bit about Derby, who was born in 1800. And the reason I'm going to choose his edition is he uh, had a gold a medal for linguistics, or for classics, as it was called in those days, at Dublin University. He was a brilliant scholar of languages in both Greek and Latin. So he knows his Bible. And more particularly, he was a godly man. He had a choice uh, of becoming a lawyer, but instead he chose to become a clergyman and then ministered to, uh, to um, uh, get Irish, uh, uh, Irish labourers in the fields in Ireland, which was where he lived. So he was a guy that put his uh, faith into practice and did not uh, just deal with the high and mighty. Um, we'll talk about the new international version. I'll bring that in mainly because that came out after the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and which were able to verify some of the original translations at least, well, more than a thousand years earlier than both the authorized version, revised version or Derby had access to. And then, of course, we use the abbreviations Old Testament for the Old Testament, New Testament, and then chapter and V for verses when we are abbreviating the verses that I'll be quoting. Okay, now let's get into the meat. This is in the tables. The top left two columns is what you'll find in this Bible handbook. You'll have a first quotation and its contradiction. And then on the right, I've chosen to make the comments as I see as I try to see if there is a contradiction there. We start right at the beginning of the Bible, chapter 2, verse 17 of Genesis. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat surely, or eat therefore, thou shalt surely die. Over here, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So it does seem to be a contradiction. They did take of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, and yet Adam died after 930 years. Is that a contradiction? I'll, I'll turn to the New Testament here. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. As for you, you were dead in your trespass and sins. Verse, and that, but verse 6, and now God has raised us up. Now note the authors 
of the Bible handbook quote the New Testament. You'll see that in a few slides. They quote the New Testament when it suits their contradictions, but they did not use this link to spiritual death. In this case, uh, it didn't take too much long. If you know the Bible, yes, we have a spiritual death, but our physical uh, life can extend. Uh, but no, foot and ball, I'm, I'm saying here, was fairly selective. Uh, if, if they'd only commented only on Old Testament, yes, I might have had a bit more of a struggle. But no, later on, you'll see they're quite happy to try and use the contradictions between the Old and the New Testament. Genesis chapter 1, verses 25 and 26. And God made the beasts of the earth and its kind, everything that creeps upon the earth uh, and after its kind, and then said, let us make man in our image. In other words, the point being, man was made after the beasts. But in Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 to 20, in the authorised version, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. In other words, he's trying to make the point, man was made after the beast there, but now we, in the sequence of the verses here, it appears that man was made before the beasts. However, both Darby, as I say, a brilliant linguist, and also the new international version taken um, after the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Now the Lord had formed every animal of the field and all the fowls. In other words, the verses, when we look at a brilliant linguist and something that's taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls, the mankind, the mankind was formed after the animals have been made. So it depends on the translations. Foot and ball, quote the authorised version here, but also use the RV2. So it's not just that they were uh, only using the authorised version. So we admit there are some translations errors in the authorised authorised version, but the general meaning is kept because really what chapter two is about is going on to say that he then made woman as a companion. And I see no contradiction there. And as I say, the brilliant linguist and NIV uh, from the um, Dead Sea Scrolls certainly does not find a contradiction. Chapter 7, verse 2, of every clean beast, this is about the flood story, of every clean beast thou shalt take thee by sevens, the male and its female, but elsewhere, but mind you, this is a chapter earlier, of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort thou shalt bring into the ark. It does seem a bit of a contradiction here. Then went in two and two unto the Noah into the ark, the male and the female. However, note Genesis verse chapter 6 and chapter 7 are statements to take beasts as male and female pairs. In the words, that's what we're talking about, is they're to take male and female pairs. You don't have the part in chapter 2 that, there was an amplification to state of those male and female pairs, there should be seven pairs of each of the clean animals. There is no contradiction. Foot and ball reverse the order. And this is where I'm afraid I was starting to get a suspicion or that they're a bit underhand. Note, they quote chapter seven, verse two, and then they go back uh, as though they reverse the order to try and contrive a contradiction. So I, I, I must confess by this stage, I'm getting a bit, suspicious of uh, how what looked like underhand methods okay genesis 26 and 12 we're talking about descendants uh of uh in this case chapter three yes okay just trying to and a fact said lived five and thirty years and begat salah this is before the flood of the uh, the genealogy of seth but in luke who also quotes the uh, genealogy from the Lord Jesus all the way back to Adam, Salo, which was born the son of Canaan, which was a son of a faxed. So, yes, there is a missing uh, person there. Luke quotes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which does have minor differences from the Masoretic text. That's the Hebrew text. The fact that we have two translations with such minor variations is better than any other ancient document. Yes, I'll admit you can find the Septuagint. And the Greek translations do differ in different places. No doubt about it. Does it phase me that I see some minor translations? Uh, again, I would invite anyone to go back to other ancient writings, and I think you'll find any variation, any 
uh, copies between two different accounts of the same, you would find that it's not such an unexpected thing. Was there perfect translation? No, that's not true. But I don't in any way see it detracting from my understanding of the general message from the Bible. Genesis 22, verse 14, and Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said, this is the point where Abraham sacrifices, um, was about to sacrifice Isaac, uh, and God provides a, a, a ram right at the last moment. That's where Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said, to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And this is the point they're making. The Lord in the Old Testament always refer, represents the Hebrew word Jehovah. So he's saying Abraham used the word Jehovah. But in Exodus, uh, we see uh, that Moses has a revelation of God and God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac and Jacob by that name of God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. And that's the point that uh, Foot and Ball are trying to make, that um, uh, how could Abraham know about Jehovah as a name of God since it was only first revealed to, to Moses? Well, my comment here, both Genesis and Exodus are known as the books by Moses, so it is not at all surprising that Moses might amend early accounts of God's work by using the name Moses himself had learned in order to identify they are the same God. It does not affect the message. Moving right along, Genesis uh, 11, chapter 11, 26 and 32. And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, uh, Nahor and Haram. And the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haram. Then into chapter 12, verse 4. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed out of Haram. When he, his father was dead, and that's actually coming out of the book of Acts, after which... I'm sorry, I forgot that the, the um, Bible handbook uses Roman numerals. I missed that one. That's chapter seven. That's uh, where Stephen is giving his account before the Sanhedrin. After living 135 years, Abraham was only 75 years old. So they're trying to say that there is a contradiction there. But as Abraham is the main character in what follows, he is mentioned as the first son of him importance but not necessarily in birth order. Abraham might well have been born when Terah was 130. Order of birthright is used in the account of Jacob and Esau. So again, it's, it's our, what's the right word? And I'll bring that out later. Our particular view on reading any document is coloured by our generation's view that any account must be in sequential series by time. That's not how the ancients necessarily did it. So who are we to impose our particular way of interpreting things on what the ancients did? Um, certainly there was no account there that Abraham was necessarily born before Nahor or, and, and Haram. Uh, all we know, though, is that uh, he was of most importance because the rest from chapter 12 onwards, we, we really are only focusing almost exclusively on Abraham. Leviticus, thou shalt not kill. Uh, in fact, Exodus the, from the Ten Commandments as well. Um, thou shalt not kill, it shall be a statute forever. But Exodus 20, in fact, I think I blew that one. Apologies, I had to do the translation and that may be Exodus chapter 10, which of course refers to the Ten Commandments, chapter 20, which should be Ten Commandments. I'll have to correct that later. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, this is back later in Exodus, Put every, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother. Kill, and now not kill, and then he's saying, go and do it. But please put the thing in context. The NIV, NIV for what it's worth, translates the word thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder. But God's judgment of rebellion required his faithful Levites, and this is the account in chapter 32, to kill those who had flaunted him by worshipping the golden calf despite all the miracles God had performed, bringing them out of Egypt, all the plagues in Egypt, and then, of course, parting the Red Sea. Yes, God did have to judge those who worshipped the golden calf instead of waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. Uh, and this comes once or twice through again, 
there's a sort of a, a sense that God can only be good. He's never going to be in judgment. Uh, we're all right. Well, I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches. And certainly that was very much illustrated in chapter 32. Numbers 12, verse 3. Now, the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Then we go to verse 31. Chapter 31, rather, and Moses was wroth, which meant angry. And Moses said unto them, Have you saved all the women alive? Now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman, but all the virgin women and children keep alive for yourselves. Hood and Ball do not understand what meekness is. Meekness is applies to yourself. Moses never stood up for himself, but here and elsewhere, Moses demanded punishment on those who subverted God's holy commands. Just a reminder, chapter 31 uh, is where the Moabite women had seduced the Israeli men and uh, in order that they might worship and, and take the fertility God Baal. And it was definitely something that God would not allow. And every woman who had seduced the uh, Israeli men had to be killed. Um, so meekness was, was not about uh, others, it was about it's only meekness was towards himself, but uh, no, he was angry when he saw uh, evil prospering and it demanded punishment. Let's go ahead to one Samuel. Now we've jumped out of the um, the early chapters of the uh, of the Bible of the whole testament. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, and behold, he keeps the sheep. Most of you may know this story uh, when David's brought into Samuel. And Jesse begat his firstborn, Eliab, and Abinadab the second, and Shimma the third, and Faniel the fourth, Redai the fifth, Odin the sixth, and David the seventh. Yes, there appears to be a contradiction between Chronicles and Samuel. Now, it's quite plausible that one of the other sons died after Samuel's anointing of David, which we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Samuel appears to have been written about 920 BC, whereas Chronicles are said to have been written about 430 BC by Ezra after the exile, by which time the missing son of Jesse may well have been long forgotten. However, look, I'll admit that both Chronicles and when you compare it with Samuel Kings, do not always match. There are some name differences. It should not be surprising because of the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem and its records, and also the Jewish use of Aramaic when they went into exile and no longer speaking Hebrew. The recorded Bible is not infallible with regards to names and numbers, but the message is. Moving on to Proverbs. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Uh, this is one of the places where he is quite happy to switch uh, to compare with the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 119, for it is written, referring to here to Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So it seems there's a contradiction there, but remember, Proverbs 9 verse 10 um, goes on to say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There are two types of wisdom. There's godly wisdom versus man's wisdom. And if you look at what was referred to, it's in the contradiction here from Isaiah chapter 29, it was talking about those who pretended to be godly, but who do not trust, uh, did not trust God to deliver them from Assyria. They wanted to go down uh, and trust in Egypt instead. So there is man's wisdom and there's God's wisdom. And they're talking, one's talking about godly wisdom in Proverbs, but the second one is referring to those who are trying to use their own smarts to work out what they should do to save themselves from the Assyrian threat. Psalm 92, verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. But in Isaiah 52, verse 1, the righteous perishes. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 2, all things come alike. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked. In other words, we all perish. I'm going to read Psalm 73 really does bring out this difference. Our eternal destiny is what really matters. And this is what Asaph, the uh, psalmist, he said, I envied the arrogant. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood 
their final destiny. Test destiny. How suddenly they are destroyed. Yet I am always with you. And afterwards you will take me to glory. So there is a contrast there. And, and this is often coming out in the contradictions that he tries to bring out. He doesn't read the full story. He takes one thing out of isolation, out of its context, or out of the wider Bible context, and then pretends it's a contradiction. You have to read Psalm 73 and you see, yes, there is profit in being righteous, righteous before God, in God's righteousness. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 17, And Joram, the son of Ahab, reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Second year there. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being then king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Now you think their second year and then fifth year, well, there's a contradiction in numbers. But note, in my Bible, it says Jehoram was co-regent with his father, Jehoshaphat, for at least three years. Now, when uh, I do remember that um, Kevin, when he was, we were reviewing this together a week or so ago, made the point it's not just in biblical years. We have um, a number of the Roman emperors would take on someone who would be co-regent with them. The account in 2 Kings chapter 8 allows for, if you read this story here, and in the fifth year of Jerome, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, being then king of Judah, Joram, the king of Joseph, uh, began to reign. Yes, Joram began to reign, um, but it doesn't say that he was supplanting Jehoshaphat. They could well be reigning together as a co-regency. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26, two and 20 years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. So he, Jehoram, father of Azahiah, died of sore disease, and Azahiah's son was made king in his stead. But the authorised version in 2 Chronicles, and this is again where we do seem to have a contradiction between what was written about 1,000, um, maybe 900 um, uh, BC and what was written about 430 BC. 40 and two years was Ahaziah when he began to reign. But if I go into the NIV, which does have access to the um, the old the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign. So NIV with access to the Dead Sea Scrolls has an earlier Hebrew source, and there is no contradiction from the oldest Hebrew text. Okay, we've rattled through the Old Testament contradictions. I hope you're not getting too bored, but um, this is how that was presented in the book. So I am having to present them in what is a fairly tedious way of comparing uh, table by table and column by column. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, God sent his only begotten son into the world. It's contradiction. And this is where he's mixing back to the Old Testament. Job chapter one, the sons of God came to present themselves before the um, Lord and Satan came also among them. The sons of God saw the, in Genesis chapter, that should be chapter six, just before the flood, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. So it seems we have an only begotten son and then we have more sons mentioned in the Old Testament. But remember, in some parts of the Bible, sons is used for being created by God. Luke Chapter 3, verse 37, calls Adam the son of God in the sense that God made him. But 1 John, which foot and ball quote, introduces Jesus as that which was from the beginning, the word of life, the eternal life, watch, which was from the Father and has appeared to us. There is a distinction if you look into the amplification, the adjectives used for each of those. The only begotten son, and then uh, obviously Jesus is exalted, 1 John there, as we look back there too. Luke chapter 3, verse 23, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And, of course, we know, most of us know about this contradiction, whereas Matthew has a different genealogy and says, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. Uh, fortunately, probably a couple of years ago, uh, I'm grateful to Kevin for having me invited to talk on Eusebius and his history of the church, about 300 days, and he addresses specifically this problem. He wrote that Joseph had a natural father, and an adoptive father after the first one died. I really would have thought that uh, Foot and Ball, if they are diligent scholars, would surely have gone to such a source as Eusebius before they made claims that, that, that this was a contradiction. Surely they should have gone to someone who was much closer to the events, who was able to get the traditions handed down on a much earlier time scale than they themselves had. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 30. God had sworn to him, that is David, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Jesus to sit on his throne. Now, the birth of Jesus was on this wise. When, as his son Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So who was the father of Jesus? And that's, I guess, the contradiction they're trying to make here. Many modern translations state Acts chapter 2, verse 30, God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne, not necessarily the fruit of his loins, but descendants on his throne. Because fruit of the loins may have been an, um, a term, a, uh, what do you call it, and, and, um, a term that meant descendant, not necessarily direct, um, I guess, gene transfer of one to another. Certainly, Jesus had David's legal descent through Joseph. And Eusebius, book one, chapter seven, also states that Mary had to be from the same tribe as Joseph as the law of Moses required. I'm afraid I'm perhaps a little bit dubious there because I do know that we read that Mary had a cousin called um, Elizabeth, who was in fact uh, married to uh, Zechariah, who was of the priestly tribe. So there might be a little bit of a contradiction there, but... Uh, I'm not going to draw a long string there, and I, I find it's a rather tenuous thing. Certainly, we know that Mary had gave birth to Jesus through a uh, appears to be the Holy Spirit's um, uh, overdwelling her. And maybe there can maybe some further discussion there, but I won't go further. And when they performed all these things according to the law of the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. That's Luke's account. But Matthew, chapter 2, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. So was it Galilee or was it Egypt? Well, all the foot and uh, all had to do was read a little bit further into Matthew and it all would have become clear. After Herod died, an angel appeared to Joseph in Egypt and said, go to Israel. And when he heard Achaelius was reigning in the place of his father Herod, he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Luke's account skips the detail of the Egyptian sojourn in Matthew, but they all end the same, ending in Nazareth where he's brought up. No contradiction. One elaborates more than the other, but we end up with the same result. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after that, John was put in prison uh, after John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. This was following, followed by the conversion of Peter and Andrew. That's Mark's account. I mean, you could have seen that. Whereas John says, after these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John was also baptizing, but John was not yet cast into prison. And it says that Peter and Andrew had already been converted. It says that in chapter 1. Ah. But Mark chapter 1, verse 16 and 18 clearly states this is the calling of Peter and Andrew to leave their secular fishing work and follow Jesus. I mean, you've got to read what they actually say. They were called to leave their fishing. It doesn't mean they weren't already followers of Jesus. John provides the account of when they first met Jesus and were convinced of who he was. You can read about that in John chapter 1. There is no contradiction. You've just got to read what had actually happened in the two accounts and not just pluck out verses. Mark, we down to the next line. Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptised by John in Jordan and immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. And the third day after Christ's baptism, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and both Jesus was, both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. The term immediately in the original Greek can also be translated as soon. Again, I thank Kevin during the dry run for taking me to what the Greek immediately actually meant. So the word and soon the spirit drove him out. If we put that into Mark, there is no contradiction between the two. And again, I guess we do recognise that the English translation of both the Old and the New Testament does have the difficulty of translating either the Greek or the Hebrew words into the true matching equivalent. As John gives the most detailed account of Jesus' early ministry, he provides the detail that Mark omitted. Again, I don't see any problem there. 
Mark chapter 1, 23 and 24. And there was in this synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? I know thee, thou art the Holy One of God. There is 1 John 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Believe, uh, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Well, of course, as we read back here on the first column, Mark chapter 1, uh, this particular evil spirit does acknowledge that Jesus has come. Jesus, now I know that you are the Holy One of God. So surely there's a contradiction there. Well, the distinction here is Mark's account is an event during Christ's earthly ministry. After his death, resurrection, ascension, then Pentecost, the church age begins, and Satan's tactics then change to deny what had happened. John's epistle, however, was written in the church age before the day of Pentecost. Again, I don't see any contradiction. We see Satan at work when Jesus is on this earth, and then we see a test that we must perform now that we have God's spirit after the day of Pentecost. Mark chapter 10, 45, 52. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of uh, people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. That's Mark's account. Matthew chapter 20, the same situation, same, uh, same uh, event that was happening. And as they departed from Jericho, a great multitude followed him. Again, that's, that's a common thing. And behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside. Mark tells us that Bartimaeus was sitting among the crowd. Yes, a blind man. And Matthew mentions another one as well. Surely that's not a contradiction. One's elaborating a little bit more. I'm sure if each of we saw the particular event, we might easily give a slightly different account and yet be seeing exactly the same and describing exactly the same event without any mistake. There's no mistake there. Matthew just elaborates a little bit more. Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. That's according to Acts. Uh, and, and the same again in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Commands that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. And then it goes on to get different accounts of where apparently, according to the author's uh, foot and ball, Jesus appeared to ascend to heaven. Whereas Mark says, he goes before you into Galilee. This is after the resurrection. There you shall see him, as he said unto you. And Matthew 28, verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. Certainly Luke makes no mention of going into Galilee, whereas both Matthew, Mark, and John do. When Luke speaks to witnesses of the resurrection, decades later, remember, I think we might have, only a few sessions ago, we agreed that Luke probably was there about AD 60, maybe AD 58. And it was actually speaking to eyewitnesses. He claims he did speak to eyewitnesses. But he only mentions Cleopas's travel between Emmaus and Jerusalem after the resurrection. Cleopas may not have gone to Galilee and the trip there happened before Luke records Jesus' command to remain in Jerusalem. It depends on the, who they were. And we don't know where Cleopas's was. And certainly I don't think we could in any way uh, sees a contradiction on the basis of what Cleopas, Cleopas saw because we did not know where he went. Now, back to the thing as to where did the ascension occur? Uh, it claims that they make, he tries to, book, tries to make a claim that uh, Bethany and Mount of uh, Olives were not at the same place. Now, Bethany is on the Mount of Olives next to Jerusalem, and neither Matthew, Mark, or John actually specifically state where the ascension took place. It might get some vague inference in here, but they need, none of them do. So there's no reason to think that uh, there's uh, any contradiction there that I could see anyway. Now we move on to the third of the, the ones. They're getting a bit shorter, guys. We've got through most of the bulky stuff. Exodus, uh, this is about divine attributes. Chapter 23, verse, uh, chapter, verse 20. Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Whereas Exodus 33, verse 11, a few verses again, notice he's shifting the verses around to try and control the contradiction. And the Lord spoke unto Moses face to face as a man speaks unto his friend. And Genesis 32, verse 30, and Jacob called the name of this place Peniel, for I have seen God's face to face, 
and my life is preserved. Now, the emphasis there is on the term face-to-face. -face. But, and again, I thank uh, Kevin and the dry run for pointing out to me, Exodus uh, 33, verse 11, face, the word term face-to-face -face can literally translate it out of Hebrew as mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, not face-to-face. -face. It's an idiom not used in English, so a common idiom face-to-face -face, is used instead. Of course, we note that Abraham before the destruction of Sodom, Jacob here and Joshua before Jericho see what's called a theophany, which seems to be a disguised, moderated version of God's full glory that was prohibited by Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. And he also appears, of course, to Isaiah, Isaiah in the day that um, King Uzziah died, to Ezekiel, and also to Daniel, two in visions. So, yes, there is probably some elaboration there that could go on, but certainly the term face-to-face -face as used in the English translation was actually meant mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, not in the full glory of God. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 23, in this, the final column, the final row here, I have sworn by myself that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear, or as Matthew reminds us, swear not at all. But... Matthew 25, 34 is about man not swearing because he does not have the power to keep his vows. And of course, if foot or ball had gone a little bit further, they would have come to verse 36 because you cannot make one hair white or black. God has the power. And that's what Isaiah was quoting. Whereas Matthew is about what we as uh, creatures on this earth can or cannot swear because we don't have the power to carry out our oaths. Moving into Romans 15, verse 23. Now, God of peace be with you all. And now again, he switches back to the Old Testament. The Lord is a man of war. Note, John 3, 17, 18. For God sent not his son of the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Now, I'll just bring that verse. It's not directly affected to war or peace. But again, and we saw it earlier on, there seems to be an overall assumption by foot and ball that God is a God of peace. He'll pat us on the head and say, tut, tut, if we do something wrong and there'll be no consequences. I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible teaches. God has gave us his only son as the most precious, the, the only sacrifice that could save us from his anger on judgment day. And he, those of us who have accepted that most perfect sacrifice, have peace. But if we reject that most wonderful sacrifice, I'm sorry, we're not going to be patted on the head. There is judgment coming. Moving down to the next one, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. 1 John 5, verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Okay, John 1, verse 1 to 2, I'm just going to remind ourselves, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was God, and the Word was, and the, was with God, and the, and the Word was God. Clearly, at the beginning of the book of John, we do identify that Jesus was God right from the beginning. John chapter 10, verse 30, I am my Father are one. Now, I'm not bringing the Holy Spirit yet because I couldn't find verse that specifically linked it the same way it did to the Son. However, divine multiple states are something that we now know in the physical state. Mass energy, you know, a photon is um, a particle of light or part of radiation, and yet we know that radiation also behaves like waves. Um, similarly, mighty particles like electrons behave like waves um, around an atom uh, due to uh, the quantum uh, state of the particular atom. So there is duality in the physical world, of course, to be fair to both foot and ball. They didn't know about that when they wrote this, but certainly we know now. So we can see equivalence in the physical realm. Uh, we know now about equivalent of having multiple states. So again, because I did a degree in physics, I have no problem in accepting that uh, God can have multiple states. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He moved David against him to say, go and number Israel and Judah. 
Whereas 1 Chronicles, this chapter 21, says, and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. So it was the Lord or was it Satan? Well, if we turn back to Job chapter 1, we shows shows that Satan does need God's permission to challenge a man. So 2 Samuel and then 1 Chronicles may each be part of a whole picture. Yes, neither is giving us the full story, but certainly from Job chapter 1, uh, God would have to give permission to Satan in 1 Chronicles before what happens in 2 Samuel happens as well. Job 26, verse 7, he stretches out the north over the empty place and hangs the earth upon nothing. And then uh, Psalm 104, the pillars of the earth are lords and he has them set on the world. Sorry, in fact, the two things there, we talk about foundations for the earth. Uh, in the first column, we had hanging out of empty space. Surely that's a contradiction. No, these verses are of poetic genre which allows the composer to choose their own metaphors to illustrate their meaning. When Wordsworth wrote his uh, poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud or hill and dale. Did we really see um, Wordsworth floating in the sky, uh, made um, up in the fluffy white things above his head? Of course not. He was using a metaphor to illustrate his walk through the hills, I believe, in the Lake District. There's nothing different from what Job describes or Psalm or Samuel described. Final section of this comparison tables. Let's make sure. Okay, we're coming, moving right along. The doers of the law shall be justified. Romans 3, chapter 3, verse 20. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Hmm. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 are almost in complete contradiction, it seems. But Romans, like many other books, needs to be read to get the context. In fact, we'll just turn to chapter 6, 9 to 11. When the commandment came, that is the law came, sin revived and I died. And the law, which was ordained to life, I found unto death. For sin taking occasion by the law deceived me and by its looming. So if you read chapter 6, you see why chapter 2 and chapter 3 are indeed consistent. Yes, the law is perfect. And if we could keep the law, Jesus would not have to die. We would all be saved because we would have kept God's law. But we can't. Because of Adam's sin, his rebellion against God, the law will always prove that we fail. Then we go to Matthew. Then uh, said Pilate unto him, Hear not how many things have witnessed against thee? And he answered to him, Never a word, insomuch the governor marveled greatly. John chapter 18, 33 and 34. Then Pilate entered the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, saying, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell him, uh, tell it thee of me? Now notice the key here is the word again. In Matthew 27, we read of Jesus' silence when being accused by the Jews, Jews before Pilate. John chapter 18 uses the word again. Pilate entering the judgment hall again, i.e. for the second time, with no mention of his Jewish accusers present in what appears to be an interrogation by Pilate and his aides, alone in which Jesus does this time respond. Again, read the whole thing, make the distinction, see what words are used. Again, makes it a second instance, not uh, different from what was happening and described in Matthew. Getting on to Luke, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all, all devils and to cure diseases. But then as we get after the Mount of Transfiguration, when we get, again, I didn't quite, should have changed these, um, uh, these verses, uh, sorry, the chapters into um, the real chapters. Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples uh, to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, because of your, your unbelief. Yes, it does seem a contradiction. I have power in the first column, but not in the second. But Matthew 27, uh, Matthew 17, sorry, uh, appears sometimes after Matthew 10, for which the disciples were given, and Matthew chapter 10, they are given, you could read it, and he gave them power. They were given specific mission and a limited duration. But then after that, until Pentecost, the disciples had yet to receive the lasting Holy Spirit. 
and had their ups and downs. We know Peter denied Jesus three times, yet previously he had acknowledged him as Messiah. So, yes, um, there were times when the disciples, when they were not given specific power, certainly had their downfalls. Uh, again, I see no contradiction there. And when Jesus was entered Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. But in Luke's of the came account, he sent unto him elders of the Jews. The, the, the uh, centurion sent elders of the Jews beseeching him that he should come and heal his servant. The accounts have much the same meaning. This is hardly a contradiction. Perhaps Matthew thought unnecessary to include the intermediaries, the elders. Again, the upshot was that the centurion's servant was healed. The fact that uh, the, uh, the centurion may have used intermediaries in one account does not in any way detract from the eventual result of what happened. And it just means like any other witness to an incident we might find in a court of law, someone sees some more detail, others do not, but the result, it's the same account and the same result. Right, well, look, thank you for bearing with me while I bolted through those comparison tables. As it was, I cut out two of those tables that I would have done because of um, the time it took during the dry run. I'm just briefly then going to touch on some other things. One of the reasons that I think the Bible reads correctly uh, is C.S. Lewis, because we know of him as a Christian apologist, but before he became Christian, as a secular professor of English literature at Oxford, Lewis knew how to recognise a polished fable of old, one that had been polished so that everything fitted together. One day, a socialist fellow lecturer dropped into his office and surprisingly said the New Testament read like history. Lewis picked up the Bible and as he read, Lewis agreed that it read as a series of accounts by independent witnesses, not a fable, neatly woven and contrived by one author. It certainly struck me. Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great, a rationalist Freemason, reputedly asked his doctor, and I've quoted the source here, what proof there was for the Bible. Sire, the Jew, was the reply. And that's rattled down for a couple of centuries. Um, because the Bible is the book about the Jews. It promises that the Jews, despite their failings, despite everything else, were given promises because of their patriarchs that could not be contradicted. And to this day, despite, well, the Holocaust, the pogroms, uh, the Inquisition, um, they're still here amongst us. And then I came across this. Bear with me just on this one. This will be one of my final slides. Just before we had the census a short while ago, um, we had the following comment report in the Australian 9th of August. A leading voice behind the no religion campaign phrases Satanism. In a, in a monthly rationalist uh, Australian webinar, President Meredith Doig discussed, uh, discussed a century uh, census 21 uh, drive for people to mark no religion. Mrs. Doig said Satanism was having an important role in pushing for equality and secularism. If anybody hasn't actually read the principles of Satanism, they're fantastic, they're very sensible. They're very secular, they're liberal, progressive, all sorts of nice things. So go Satanists. While noting the five tenets of the Noosa Temple of Satan, most of which rationalists could easily agree with, Mrs. Doig, Ms. Doig said she wasn't a Satanist, nor were her positive views on beliefs of Satan in any way behind her support for 21, Census 21. Firstly, I'm not defending the Satan Satanic principles. I was stating that they were perfectly reasonable and appealing to people who value a secular liberal democracy. I'm afraid I just, having prepared my uh, presentation thus far and having read the in forward and the um, introduction to um, the Bible handbook, I found it very, very interesting to see the secular people are quite happy to bring on uh, everything that Satanists uh, agree with. Um, I think it was Lenin who has purportedly said uh, about those in the West who supported the Bolshevik Revolution, they were useful idiots. I wonder here who is the useful idiots? Is it the Satanists being useful idiots to the rationalists? Or, or perhaps, and this is probably my worldview, it's the uh, rationalists who are being useful idiots to the Satanists. 
Are we feeling devastated yet? Our Bible handbook, this is what was said, our Bible handbook celebrated its diamond jubilee in 1948, first issued in 1990. It has now survived the storms of religious controversy and continues to carry devastation into the ranks of Christian bibliators without receiving any, any adequate answer. So what were their methods? They selected isolated Bible verses to construct contradictions, often out of the surrounding context. Context. Remember when you select chap verses and chapters, the Bible is only divided into chapters and verses in the last 700 years. So selecting individual verses fragmented the meaning of the original unified text intended by the authors. And of course, as we saw, in some cases, they even reversed the orders of the verses so they could fabricate the contradiction. They chose New Testament verses to contract, contradict Old Testament verses when it suited but ignore this when it did not suit their case. They ignored readily available ancient sources such as Eusebius, which explained apparent contradictions. And subsequent editions of the Bible handbook ignored later expert Bible translations, which have access to the Dead Sea Scrolls, which removed some of their apparent contradictions. Lessons for us, always read Bible books in full to get its message in full, its full context intended by the author. Selecting verses out of context is a pretext for heresy. And of course, we do have, uh, unfortunately, some sects in Christianity who have done just that. Understand the genre you are reading. Whilst both Old Testament and New Testament record history, the Old Testament has many poems and songs which use metaphors that should not be taken literally. Ancient civilizations place different emphasis than we do on recording events. They sometimes chose thematic groupings, uh, groupings of events that did not always accord chronologically. I'll just mention one that I went through when I was reading Kings recently. We know that Assyria besieged Jerusalem under Hezekiah after the Babylonian ruler Merodach Balaban sent envoys to Hezekiah. Though this is not the order given in two kings, which first describes God's deliverance from Assyria as the most important event in Hezekiah's reign. Um, I think it's somewhere said that we, each generation has a great arrogance to the way it treats writings of previous uh, generations. We, we think everyone should be interpreted to call the way we think that writings should be done and history should be recorded. Well, I'm sorry, that's arrogance on our part. We should, of course, always enter into the way, the mindset of those who which the writing was originally written. Thank you. Um, yeah, feel free to, um, you can stop sharing now, uh, Stephen. Okay, well, I'll stop. And um, could you... Uh, unmute mute your microphone, sir, because we can now have a, a joint conversation. Um, now, um, uh, the usual way we handle the discussion is to go through the um, chat comments um, and uh, let people who made the comments speak on it. Unfortunately, I, most of it, um, the initial comments are from me. <laughs> and so um, if I, I don't I do that, then... Um, It'll end up me hogging the show, which is not highly um, desirable. Um, now, uh, but uh, I will make a com comment. Um, in, in some of your initial slides, um, the foot and ball made the uh, observation that they actually treat the Bible um, more harshly and strictly uh, than what they would treat other um, documents. And um, in a sense, I'm sympathetic for them, don't agree with you, um, from the uh, point of view that uh, that may actually be valid. <coughs> Since the Bible does make very high claims for itself, it should then be judged by very high standards. So um, I'm um, a little bit more sympathetic to their view. Mm. Uh, you're a muter, by the way, Steve. Sorry, right. 
Yeah, well, look, yes, no, I mean, and look, at the time they did that, um, yes, no doubt, and we're talking about 1888, that was obviously that Bible was used, you know, to swear in judges and swear oaths um, in, in Parliament and, and so on and so forth. Yes, um, because England at that stage anyway was um, nominally at least a Christian nation. That was their religion. I mean, of course, the... Um, even to this day, I think the Church of England comes under the auspices of the Crown, doesn't it? Uh, so, yes, that, that's why they attacked it. Uh, but I, I, I don't see, but I, I do see there's got to be some consistency if they, certainly when I looked at some of the underhand ways they went about. Um, but why shouldn't they, for instance, attack uh, Shakespeare, who was written about the same time as the authorised version? Surely his history, historic records uh, equally, perhaps prone to examination to the same degree. Mm. Yeah, but uh, um, um, Shakespeare has had a lot of influence, but I don't, don't think he's in the same league as the Bible. Okay, you're right. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, uh, the one of your initial like, when did Adam die? One of your initial ones. I, uh, it kind of amazed me that um, they would bring this up as a contradiction. So the intent of the uh, death. Uh, it's pretty obvious that they died. Uh, they died in their relationship with God in a day, and then they eventually exactly. died physically. So I, I found it just amazing that they would actually bring that up as a contradiction. Um, on chapter two, it says it kind of infers that um, uh, animals came along after human beings. Yeah. Um, but um, it, even if you uh, say the word is formed or have formed, um, uh, like God always had the creation of human beings in, in mind. Yes. yes. And so, um, uh, have, and probably foresee, foresaw that um, um, they needed companions or whatever. Yes. And so the animals were created before human beings, but the animals were... Uh, always in intent uh, to support humanity. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, so, yeah. so, um, so if you kind of view it in that way, then um, God's intent and God's acts maybe occur in a different order. <laughs> well, perhaps, but I mean, yeah. they were trying to contrive a con contradiction as what was the yeah. order of creation, um, and certainly it appears that the translation and the modern translation anyway taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls certainly does allow for animals to be created before mankind. Yeah. Um, then on your comment on um, uh, Sala. Yes. Um, who's the father? Was he? Yes. Um, so what you kind of inferred from that was, all right, this is an unimportant contradiction, but... Um, uh, but it depends. If you actually take um, an absolute inerrancy view of the Bible, okay. yes, then yes. it creates a problem. Yes, yes. But if you, if you kind of have a, a bit looser view on, on uh, inerrancy, then it's um, not a problem. <laughs> so it does has, have some implications in terms of some views of uh, biblical inspiration. Okay, yeah. Okay, no, well, good point, good point. Um, Elsewhere, I've read. Okay, now that, that's all I'll say. Yes, you're right. There is appears definitely a contradiction there. Does it yeah. really affect the gospel? Does it affect uh, God's um, major story of how He looked after man? No, I don't believe it does. Right. Okay. I'll I'll skip the uh, rest of my um, comments and get on to other people's. Um, uh, Jeff Russell, uh, son and begat in the Bible do not have the limited. Uh, meaning we apply to those words today. Um, and or would you like to comment that, Jeff? Yeah, okay. Uh, look, I am sorry I wasn't with um, with this broadcast right from the very beginning. I missed uh, perhaps just a few minutes, but anyway, I think I've caught the the uh, the bulk of it. Um, yeah, in the Bible, I mean, look, the, the very beginning of the New Testament says this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, yes. the son of David, the son of Abraham, and that's obvious from that that son doesn't mean literally son like you know richard is my son he's my direct son you know and i'm his direct father in, in the bible it's used um it, it can mean descendant so it could mean 
grandson. It could mean great grandson. It could mean great 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 grandson. You know, as it is in in the case of Matthew one verse one. Similarly, with begat, it doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, it does mean that there's a line of descent there. That's for sure. So that um, Abraham uh, begat Isaac, who begat Jacob. We do know in those cases that well, that is literally father son father son but you could also say abraham begat um jacob and joseph and so on because he begat the one who then begat the one that begat you know uh, and i think in the bible both in the old testament and the new testament those terms um uh, it, it's perfectly understandable uh, that they they use those terms in that way it doesn't literally mean it doesn't strictly mean father son as we would think of it today and it does, begat doesn't mean literally that it wants to gain father, son, directly like that. So there's really no contradiction there. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Just a comment overall. Honestly, um, the, the, these contradictions that are brought up are just pathetic. They really are. If I was a leading atheist or the head of the atheist society today, I would be embarrassed to put forward this as the list of contradictions. If this is the best they can do. It is pathetic. It really is. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to be fair, Jeff, of course, and, and yeah. Um, yeah. Kevin pointed out, yes, we, we have the list of genealogies, one or two uh, wrong names here or there in two different accounts of the genealogies. Yes, we are not perfectly inerrant in the translations we have before us, but does it affect what I take from the Bible? No. It doesn't. Yeah, I think there are some cases, not in the list that uh, in that book that you've used, there are some issues that really do stretch our minds a bit and uh, to try and resolve what appears to be a contradiction. Um, and there are, there definitely are such cases, but it's not those, not those ones, that's for sure. That's for sure, yep. Um, you also, uh, Jeff, you also stated, thou shalt not kill what about animals. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, okay. Well, once again, the command itself says, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't even limit it to human beings. It, what about animals? All the way through, the, the, the animals have been there for uh, to be both to be sacrificed and to be meat for human beings. It's, um, you know, it's just reading it in a very um, wooden kind of way. Obviously, um, it means to not kill human and human beings. It just says thou shalt not kill, but it means human beings in an illegal, improper, non-judicial way, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. But no, no, and you're right. Later in the law, we have the uh, with the refuge cities where it clearly states you can flee to a refuge city. Yeah. And then the, uh, at least for a live priest alive, and then judges will determine whether it was an intentional act or That's whether right. it was an accidental act. Right. And if it's an accidental act, there, um, you are not guilty of a fraud. Right, right from back at the time of Noah. I mean, God said um, uh, after the Noah and the flood episode, he said, um, whoever kills, man is made in the image of God, whoever takes the life of a human being improperly yes. must be killed. Yes. Because they've, uh, you know, it just must be that way. So you have to put these things in its overall context. Uh, and what, what they've done over and over is just to take, like Steve, you've said, they've taken things out of context. They've just taken one little thing in isolation and not tried to look at the whole yes. picture of even in one book of the Bible, let alone the whole Bible. Exactly. No, exactly. Exactly. All right. Um, I will just skip some of my comments. Uh, Jeff Russell, immediately, how often do we all say things that are not literally true? Perhaps even these authors, foot and ball, have done the same. So, um, Yeah, well, I mean, we, we do the same over and over. So not only do we use terms like, uh, you know, the sun rising and the sun setting, which is not literally true, but we'd also use the words like immediately or straight away or anything. Well, we don't mean literally that that in the very next second that something happened. Right. Um, and surely the biblical authors have got the right to um, use literary language in a literary way. Um, Mark is definitely, he definitely does use the word immediately quite a few times. Right. And he's using it, he's doing it for certain effect. Right. Um, 
So it doesn't mean that it was the next second. Uh, it means it was pretty pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. In his mind, it's the next most significant thing that happened. That's, mm -hmm. It's quite reasonable. They're, they're, and once again, it's a very wooden kind of approach on the part of those authors um, yes. Yes. Uh, to, to take it to take issue with the use of that word even. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, no, sorry, I, I will intervene, of course. Yep. It, it does, they did point out that, of course, um, Mark says they immediately, they immediately went to one place, whereas John says, no, they went, he, he, that's right, he went immediately for his temptation, whereas John okay. points out that, in fact, no, after this baptism, he actually went to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. So he did have to, I did have to make some sort of exclamation as to why that was so. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, well, the temptation did occur before the wedding in Cana. Yeah, well, the temptation appears to occur. Uh, he, 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 what happens immediately after the baptism? That's what That's right. is the issue. Mark says he went immediately out to the wilderness and got tempted. That's right. Whereas in John, which does elaborate a lot more on Jesus's early life, and again, I'll just remind folks that this is Eusebius or someone who said. That John wrote his gospel many decades after, well, decades after the other, and he just tried to fill in the gaps that the other gospel writers had not. Now, he knew the other gospel writers had done a good job, but he just wanted to fill in some gaps. And what he did was fill in some of the detail of the early part of Jesus' ministry. And in this case, what happened after his baptism? He went to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. So it's quite possible that he went to a wedding and then was led out to the temptation. Does John have the temptation of Christ in the gospel? No, he doesn't at all. But oh. but but it, it yeah. what happened, uh, it's not so much that in relation to the temptation, is what happens after Jesus was baptized. Well, he Did went he... into the wilderness. And later well, on, he went to the I think if you read the God, it, it, it says something like in Good. John, it says a few days after he's baptized, you know, the account, he then went to a cane of Galilee. Whereas we said we hear about 40 days of you know, in the wilderness. So, oh, okay. me, uh, look, there does appear to be a contradiction there. But I'll have look at that. Yeah, please go and do so. Yeah, there does appear to be a contradiction. But as I say, John is very careful only to fill in some of the gaps, but he doesn't yeah. mention the the uh, the uh, temptation. Okay. Um, I think um, I ought to clarify um, what I told you about face to face versus mouth to mouth. Yes. The mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, idiom occurs in uh, John's epistles. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah, so the mouth-to-mouth -mouth idiom is a, a Greek idiom. Oh. So they would say mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, whereas we would say face-to-face. -face. So, um, but what, what I'm just saying is, uh, like, the languages are idiomatic. Yes. So as if you actually take literal words, then there may be an idiom associated with it. Yes. Um, so it's wrong to actually take it liter literally and then say it's a contradiction. <laughs> That's but but yeah, I just uh, say the mouth to mouth. Okay, one, well, I might one, one face uh, the face to face. I wasn't talking about what was in the Old Testament. I was talking about okay. what was in the. Well, okay. Uh, then yeah. I might stand. Uh, uh, yeah, just just saying that in case somebody goes back and checks you out in the Old Testament, it, it may okay. be literally say face to face in the Old Testament. And it, it is. It actually. And is. it is. Yes. Yeah. It definitely yeah. is face to face. In the Old yep. Testament, the Hebrew word is panim. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that correction. I look, I, I will say though, again, he reversed the order. And if you read the sequence of the verses originally put there, Moses having a talk to God. He's not, he's, he's having a talk to God. So uh, face to face, he's having a talk to God. But the emphasis yeah. is on the talking face to face. Yeah. And only then does he say, let me see your full glory. So there's some. It, Moses wasn't happy that he'd seen the full glory if he was having this face-to-face -face conversation. He actually wanted to see something more than what he'd had yeah. in that initial conversation face-to-face. -face. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with the principle of what you were saying. And that's where he's hidden in the rock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, let's see. Tom Daly. <laughs> Uh, well, sorry, I shouldn't have laughed. Um, well, I, I think it makes it hard to claim literal in inerrancy without huge mental gymnastics. Would you like to start, uh, talk to that, Tom? Yeah, I mean, you just, I, I, I know we're sitting here going, oh, that's not a very good argument. But frankly, if I was to put my undecided hat on and I look at, there's a whole book here, um, and and I was just trying to look up. Uh, there's an Underceptions John Dixon 
uh, podcast on Bible mistakes, similar genre uh, to what you're doing here, um, Steve. Yeah. And, um, and, and honestly, it's almost like, never mind the quality, feel the width, um, if you remember that uh, saying. Um, the, I have no problem with the Bible as a unified story leading to Christ. I think that's what the two guys on the way to Emmaus found out, right? Yes. Um, well, I wonder whether our attempts to do what we're doing now actually turn out to be counterproductive um, and necessary, necessary. But I think we pat ourselves on the back a little bit when we don't see the weight of the question. And I think that becomes particularly problematic for those people claiming inerrancy. In fact, I don't understand how you could be a literal inerrantist I, and that's a political as much as a theological position. But anyway, that that was the that was the basis behind my comments. Okay, now full full comment, uh, and that's where I really liked what C.S. Lewis's the comment about C.S. Lewis. He knew what a fable looked like and how it was contrived, and how all the ends were neatly tied neatly tied together at the end, and you could see, yes, yeah, smooth flowing, everything was tied up and, and all good. That was a fable. If you have an eyewitness account of things, you don't find everything tied up neatly. You do have slight emphases and, and yes, even some contradictions, apparently. If you go to a court of law, it becomes beyond reasonable doubt if it's a, if the uh, different witnesses see something that by and large is exactly what you'd expect to see from people viewing from slightly different angles. Yep. Yeah. Um, Kevin, can I ask, when was this doctrine of inerrancy invented? I've got a feeling it's around 100 years old as an American reaction against the critical liberal theologians. Mm. Yeah, yes. it, it absolutely is. It's uh, You can trace it back to the southern United States of about 100 to 150 years ago, but in particular, to the publication of so-called fundamentals, where they, they really made a case. And this is where much of American theology has gone completely off the rails because they're trying to make the whole of scripture with all its huge varied uh, literary idioms, they're trying to shoehorn that into an absolute straight-jacketed modern literal view and it just doesn't work uh, and of course you're going to come up with all kinds of problems of literal inerrancy uh, if you if you look particularly at the first 11 chapters of genesis of course it makes no sense if you're treating it absolutely literally but if you treat it from the point of view of the hebrew very um it's a literary uh, form which is full of imagery and, and uh, parable and uh, all sorts of sort of uh, colorful ways of, of picturing what's going on. If you look at it from the Hebrew perspective, it all forms into place and all of these literal inerrancy problems just disappear. Yeah, well, I grew up on a Baptist mission, an independent Baptist mission to the Aborigines in Alice Springs, Yundamu, Tennant Creek and elsewhere in the territory. And they never got hung up on literal anything, so long as the meaning was consistent. Absolutely. And we, it's a big problem in some parts of English, in that English is the only language which had a, has a category of second cousins once removed. Every, for all other languages, cousin extends way beyond what we might call cousin, and so does the word, bro word brother. Yes. And... Um, and the inerrancy thing is, uh, and in the early church, they thought about, we've got these four gospels, they say different things. Do we combine them all? No, no, witnesses will differ when they see an ordinary event. This is such an extraordinary event, they will see different things. And it reminds me of the time I turned up for a morning shift in the emergency department. And the night doctor said, have these two doctors, two fellows come in from a camping event down on the bottom end of Fleurieu Peninsula. 
and they're in a tent and there's some sort of funny attack and this and that and they got these injuries and and uh, and she said i knew that they were lying because they both told exactly the same story <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly exactly um gordon you made a co comment um sorry somebody wanted to say something I was just going to comment briefly that even the term literal inerrancy is a very strange uh, term. I mean, what is what is meant by literal? Jesus said, I am the door. Is Jesus a door? You know, that's, is he literally a door? Uh, that's just one of a million things you could refer to. Uh, the whole idea of literal inerrancy is, a, is rather odd. We need to understand um, the Bible. I have a huge respect for um, the Bible writings and that, but they need to be understood. Um, we need to really get into what the author was actually saying. And for that, we need to know uh, the people he was addressing, the culture of the times and everything. And that, I don't think that means we're acting in a condescending way about them at all. We are far from it, but it's not, what they said was not literally, in many, many cases, literally true. You know, just like a lot of what we say is not literally true either. You know, well, well, I, I have yeah. questions. So, Go on. you know, well, God's mighty outstretched arm was it his left one or his right one? I mean, where? I mean, surely there's got to be some clarifications about that. I think you've got your tongue in your cheek, haven't you? Oh, very firmly, <laughs> very, very firmly. <laughs> Yeah, I would go much further than Jeff uh, in saying that uh, literal inerrancy isn't just odd. Literal inerrancy is wrong, demonstrably wrong. Well, I don't think they know what they mean, really. Well, you know, when you actually look at it, I actually question these, these sort of fundamentalist views as to what they actually mean. Uh, they get tied up in all kinds of uh, knots. You know, it just doesn't make sense. All right, um, Gordon, you made a comment about uh, football, clearly made no attempt to consider the uh, appropriate Hebrew and New Testament genre. I think you've already spoken on that, haven't you? So, well, Hebrew and Greek, I would say. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yes, I mean, there are all these different styles of writing in the Bible, and you can't just shoehorn it into one simplified, simplistic concept. It's, it's ridiculous. Mm. Uh, from Paul Phillips, welcome, Paul, to your first Zoom meeting. Um, a, a, you may ask a question, uh, have there been any published rebuttals? Uh, so that's a question back to Steve. Are you are muted? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Paul. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I just need to clarify, published rebuttals of me or... No, 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 no. Uh, no our football. Or football. I, I was not aware of any, I must confess. So I just did took what I was given and have obviously made my own attempt to uh, rebut uh, their um, contradictions, but I was not aware of any others. That have been made. In fact, they claim, in fact, if I may go back, uh, I'll just be with me, I'm going to go back to what they actually claimed in their forward. Um, Okay, here we go. The first issue was made in 1880. It has now survived the storms of religious controversy and continues to carry devastation into the ranks of Christian uh, bibliolators without receiving any adequate answer. Well, they claim there's been no adequate answers. Uh, and yeah, I think I'll just stop there. That's, yeah. that's what they claim in the book. Does it actually deserve an adequate answer or an answer of any kind. I mean, these are people who quite obviously have made up their mind not yes. to believe the Bible. Yes. And, and there's no point in arguing with them, really, because there is just nitpicking, which they will dismiss. Yes. So why bother trying to rebut their arguments? Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, right at the beginning, I was very grateful for being given this book because it was a relatively easy one <laughs> to attempt to rebut. <laughs> All right. So um, um, this these may. Did you want to say anything on that, Paul? No. Right. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, well, except, <laughs> um, the only, I guess, thing I did observe is that it was what 1948. But uh, it was 88 was when it first started. 
Yes, but the republished. Well, we got version. the tenth edition, um, and that was fifty three. So the book we looked at was nineteen fifty three. So that's a little while ago. So I was just hoping that there might have been some rebuttal published in that in the intervening years. Oh, there probably has been. I think Google will tell us the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just thought you might have done the research. Yeah, uh, I, I could have, but I was relying on this, uh, the skeptics in Adelaide to have done the research and given me their latest and greatest. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jesus is Joseph's uh, legal descendant, presumably is not enough to satisfy the fruit of David's law in its requirement. Yeah, so no, I, I, I accept that. And that's why I did use some of the other translations. Um, I, look, I'd go back to the particular verse because the particular verse, and I guess I was going through, was it the Bible Gateway? Did use a slight a descent. The word descendant, rather than fruit of the loins, is used in some of the other translations. Again, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't know which is correct, but certainly there were alternate um, translations. Yep. And also, um, I think there's another question from Paul. Uh, what does Eusebius of Caesarea say regarding Jesus having two fathers? Okay, D uh, Paul, have you ever um, read Eusebius? I have not. Okay. Look, I, again, as I mentioned earlier, I was given the task by Kevin of actually presenting Eusebius three or four years ago, and uh, I found it very, very um, useful to read that book. I probably downloaded it from Kindle, oh, no, a few dollars. And uh, if you go to chapter, where have I said chapter, I've given you the, the I think it's chapter one, verse, chapter, or se book, section one, chapter seven, he, he does go through a number of the, um uh the 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 background because remember he lived in about he wrote this about 300 ad and he talks to i think it was africanus was someone who talked to the life oh sorry to the, the the descendants of jesus earthly family and because of who jesus claimed he was he said they did document quite well their oral history of who jesus was and where his fathers came from so with over a course of let's say maybe 250 or maybe 270 years, that oral history, which was the way most of the Jews translated, transmitted there, became known. Um, Eusebius lived in Caesarea, so he's just up the, the, down the road from them. And um, to him, a, a bishop who certainly had lots of records that he could have got to, certainly said, this is the story passed on to us by those who knew their family. But uh, he did, in fact, have a, what, a lever of marriage. Uh, his first father died, or Joseph's first father died, and then he had an adopted father who came in, both from different branches of David's descendants. Hmm. I know that's something we often see. Some people would claim one's Mary's genealogy and one's Joseph's, but according to Eusebius, he lived much, much closer and indeed had much more access to the, um, the records of the day his view was, in fact, uh, there was the first. His first father died, and then another father took him over as as adopted. He married and, a mother. And so, Eusebius was a historian, and he he was a bishop of Caesarea, uh, but he chose to try and uh, describe the Christian faith from all the records that he had. I remember, and I just I don't mean to go too much into Eusebius. But he arrived on the scene at the time that Constantine took over as emperor. So we wanted to record, and firstly, he records the very bloody and bloodthirsty persecution of Christians in the intervening centuries. But at the same time, he wants to justify how the history of the church was. Because he had ancient sources uh, that we know of probably only through him. But he did try and do a concept job. This is why we believe it, because these people said this. And that's what he got, for instance, on why Joseph appears to have two different fathers. Uh, did um, Steve address your question, Paul? He did. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, the um, oh, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, uh, Eusebius wrote uh, uh, a huge document called Ecclesiastical Church History. That's so right. he, he was... Deliber deliberately writing a history book. <laughs> he was, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, another comment from you. Good spirits confessing Jesus came in the flesh in the church age. Does that mean uh, that in the church age, spirits won't ever confess Jesus in the flesh as occurred in Mark chapter 
Um, so do you want to speak to that to clarify your question, Paul? Sure. So the contradiction was that um, spirits were confess an evil spirit was confessing Jesus in one passage, and then in a later passage, Jesus or someone was explaining that um, only spirits that confess Jesus in the flesh are good. So it tells you whether a, a spirit is good or not, right? And so, and your explanation was, well, in the church age, um, it's different from Jesus age. So, well, yeah. hmm. and then, so my question is, does the flip side also not occur now? So if it's a test for, okay, if a spirit confesses Jesus in the flesh today, then we say good spirit. And if the spirit doesn't confess, uh, confess Jesus in the flesh today, then evil spirit. But are we saying that the Jesus experience won't occur ever today? Or hasn't occurred since yeah, well, started. yeah. Um, look, the answer is I don't really know, Paul. I don't honestly don't know. I just know that in a number of instances in the, the Gospels, we see that Jesus does want to silence those spirits that are trying to um, announce who he really is. Uh, in fact, that's consistent, of course, with uh, the uh, Isaiah, where he'll come as a, as a bruised reed and one that's not lift himself up. Um, so I, I look, the answer is I, I don't know because I don't live in the age of Jesus. That's now past history. What I can say is that we do have what one John, John the uh, epistle writes, and I think it's uh, his first epistle, that we are to test the spirits these days by asking the question, did Jesus come in the flesh? And that's, I guess, the command to me as a, as a Christian in this age now. Hey, I, I, I two comments on it if, within the uh, synoptic gospels uh, why is jesus um um trying to suppress the spirits revealing that he's the son of god is it, and, and to me it's because jesus it was spilling the beans too early yep yep um, and but so post resurrection that no longer applies the so spilling the beans too early factor like there, there's an open disclosure now that jesus is the son of god and it's come in the flesh. Yes. Yes. And um, also, uh, where it, uh, uh, one John makes that comment, uh, every spirit, he was, uh, it may have been countering a, a heresy called Docetism. Yes. Uh, where um, they were saying in Docetism, people were saying that Jesus wasn't really a man, he had only had the appearance of a man. Yeah. yeah. And so um, he was countering. Um, John was account in count countering that heresy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, da, 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 da. That's it for the uh, the um, um, chat comments. Uh, so it's open slather from now. I noticed that Tom has made a comment. He's given me a link to uh, what's that? Underceptions.com. Tom, is that another book that gives contradictions in the Bible? Uh, no, it's uh, John Dixon's um, podcast. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. Or a link to John Dixon's <laughs> podcast that I mentioned earlier, where it's the 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 same. Um, you know, it's the same thing as you're doing here. Okay. Thanks. All right. So uh, people feel uh, feel free to click on that link and bring up the web page, and um, and you can have a look at it later. All right. Any other? Comments? Oh, yeah, one, one, one thing. Um, um, you kind of looked at it um, from our reaction to the book, and we're, we're Christians, and um, so we kind of got a sim sympathetic view towards the Bible. But um, in general principle, when uh, people actually come to you and say, oh, the Bible's full of rubbish, mm. um, how do we kind of react and, uh, and respond to that? How should we conduct ourselves when people make these sort of claims? Yeah. So are you asking me, Kevin? Oh, it's a general question. I general question. All. I'll, I'll let someone else answer that one then. I, I have um, I've formed after a number of years investigating, certainly listening to you guys here, I've formed um, some fairly strong opinions on that. 
but largely they can't. They're not my thinking. They're from Andy Stanley, but I don't go quite as far as Andy Stanley does. And he has a series of podcasts. That basically, we don't. Our faith isn't based on the Bible, but it's based on the person and the claims of Jesus Christ. So he says that getting into what we're doing now is not really the right. He suggests it's not really the right way to go to convince or to deal with unbelievers, because you know, sort of. If as if as if our if if our faith relies on not finding a valid contradiction in the Bible, I think our faith of faith is very tenuous. Is the point that he's making? Um, and he basically says his the Bible exists because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ doesn't exist because of the Bible. And his suggestion is that we actually just focus on the person of Jesus Christ and the reliability of the New Testament or the sources and stuff. And then this stuff becomes noise afterwards to us believers as well as to the unbeliever. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's very much um, the way I've processed it for a few years because I I struggled with this. I, like I, I don't think you guys, so, well, sometimes we don't give it enough weight. I had two questions years ago one did god exist second can i rely on the bible so if god exists why why christ christ means i have some belief or some efficacy in the bible then i struck this inerrancy stuff because i was living in the us right and that was more of a problem than 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 a solution so i don't know i don't know if, i don't know if that helps but i can find the andy stanley series I think it's who needs God, and it was brilliant. It talks about how the Bible exists because of Christ, and not not for Christ because of the Bible. I think Tom makes a, an excellent point there. Um, we should, when we're talking to non Christians, we should be concentrating on, on the positives. You know what we do get out of the Bible, not these spurious, trivial, unimportant little snipes that, that don't really mean anything. You know, let, let's concentrate on who Jesus is, what he's done. That's that's what's really important. And the rest is just, you know, so trivial. But we only so, know we only know about Christ through the Bible. That's exactly the point I was about to make, Kevin. And therefore, the Bible only has to be reliable enough to actually convince us of the birth, resurrection, uh, death and resurrection of Christ. But we also have extra biblical material. So the Bible has to be trustworthy. It doesn't have to be infallible. Yes. Also, when people uh, come to you and say the Bible is full of rubbish, you kind of think, well, um, where are they coming from? <laughs> um, and um, uh, if they start with such a derisive uh, starting point, um, how do we re react? Like, mm. yeah, I mean, look, I guess each of us, most of us are old enough now to have lived in the secular world for quite some time. Um, and you've probably heard the expression, uh, what you're telling me is, um, is, uh, sorry, is, is being drowned out by who you are. It's the way we live to we'll often communicate our faith much more eloquently than us necessarily quoting a verse here or a verse there or otherwise trying to argue the point. It's our character, it's our faith that should shine through as, as who we are. It seems like the, word, the term inerrancy is, uh, well, there seems to be several voices here that don't think that that term is particularly helpful or particularly accurate. So what would people here think is a better term to use that you were trustworthy mm. but what, like trustworthy. Tr trustworthy in what sense though trustworthy to do what well um do you have people you trust well the question is again what do i trust them to do what exactly well you believe they're honest and they're sincere 
and they're attempting to tell you the truth, even though maybe they make a, a slip here and there, unintentional what, slip. What, what about truthful? What about yeah. the Bible? The Bible Project regards the Bible as a unified story, and N.T. Wright says it this way as well, should not use it as a textbook, right? But it's actually a unified story pointing to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess that perhaps where the Americans were coming from is that as soon as you say that the Bible isn't um, or the inerrancy is not an accurate reflection of the text, if as soon as you go down that path, the, then you open it up for debate i.e. which bits do I accept and which bits don't I accept? Yeah. Is yeah, that fair? But, but, you know, the, um, the fundamentalist view is always trying to make this argument that uh, if you don't believe this literally, then you can't believe any of the other stuff. What we're really looking for here is the truth, the spiritual truth. And the spiritual truth is inerrant in a way. Um, but the spiritual truth isn't necessarily the modern literal truth. The spiritual truth comes through all these complicated literary idioms which make up the Bible. And, and we just need to read it with, with that sort of uh, perspective in mind. Think Hebrew, basically. I, I think I too some of this problem comes from the idea that the Bible is the word of God. Jesus Christ is the word of God. Yeah. And the Bible is a book about the Word of God. Mm. 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 I, well, I, reading in... I don't have any problem with saying that I do believe the Bible is the written Word of God. And its intention is to, uh, to take us to Christ, who is the living Word of God. Um, and... Um, but it, 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 I, I really balk at the the um, statement of literal uh, inerrancy. Uh, I don't think that is at all helpful. But I do believe it is the Word of God, and I think it says it. Second of Timothy three sixteen is that the right yes. quote? Yes. Um, we, we, where Paul writes to Timothy, and he says about what what the point of the scriptures uh, are, and that they're able to make us uh, wise unto salvation. So they're if they're saving human beings, um, they're they're profitable for uh, for for teaching, for reproof, mm -hmm. uh, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person of God, man and woman, uh, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And uh, I think that's the purpose of uh, of the scriptures that we have. And as we read them, um, we read them with that kind of um, that um, understanding, they really will take us to Christ. If they don't, um, then it, they haven't done. Um, they're, they're not doing what they should do for us at all. I think I don't want to belittle the Old Testament. The Old Testament sets the framework. You now the fall tells us that's why we need Jesus because we've we are we were along with Adam. We rebelled against a perfect creation, and um, we have inherited the uh the sinful nature that he caused to fall away and eve caused to fall to fall on us all that's why we need a savior if it wasn't for the fall we wouldn't need a savior oh, yeah, um, the world is in gross darkness the, the whole world the world around them back in the old testament days and ever since is actually in gross darkness unless god's light shines into it which is done in christ and revealed through the bible yes well, look, I, I, I see the temptations that are given to Eve. I know in my own heart that they're the temptations that, that Satan whispers in my ear as well. They're there. And I, I know that along with Eve, um, I have fallen because of that. And I need a savior. Uh, in Jeremiah, it says, blessed is the man, <laughs> I would be woman too, who trembles at my word. Hmm. And um, so... Um, you have to kind of treat it with an enormous amount of respect. Mm. And so that means kind of studying it and uh, respecting its context and all those sort of things. I'd also say that quite often the Bible is not easy to understand. 
mm-hmm. and it's uh, meant to be struggled with. <laughs> um, to uh, if you tremble at it, you'd also struggle with it, and uh, if you <laughs> misinterpret it, well, guess whose fault it is. Um, but it's yeah. So, uh, but I don't actually start with um, a kind of a dogmatic position on the status of the Bible. Um, but um, so it's kind of the reverse. Um, when I read it and struggle with it, it gives an impression on me. <laughs> so it's what it does to me rather than what I do to it in terms of uh, what sort of straight jacket I want to put on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeff, you, you, that verse you mentioned from, uh, is it 2 2 I yeah. forget which one it was. 3 six, Paul's, um, he's saying quite rightly that it's, it's all scriptures are useful for teaching and all the rest of it. Um, but he also uses of scripture that word theopneustos, you know, God breathed. It's That's all right. God breathed. And I think a lot of the problem comes from misinterpretation of what we mean by that. Now, some of the fundamentalists will say, God breathed, that means absolute, literal, inerrant truth. Um, but that's actually not what is meant by the used us. It's, it's, the, uh, it's the sort of spiritual truth, the, the spiritual thoughts of God coming to us from the Bible. That's mm. what he's talking about, not, not the absolute literality. Mm. The interesting thing is that in the end, it's not an intellectual matter. You know, no. having a higher intellect isn't going to get uh, um, more of uh, an understanding of God's word actually in us because it's not strictly an intellectual thing. Um, God, God's being people can know the Bible back to front and know, you know, the meaning of every original word and everything and still not know God because they, they, they refuse to come to Christ, um, you know. That's yeah. how it is. Uh, it's, 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 the wisdom of the world is not yeah. the wisdom right. that comes from above. Yes, different. But you, you know, also get your ad- attitude to the written word from Jesus too. Look at how he regards the written word. You know, it's what he quotes in Resisting Temptation. Uh, he says, I, you know, over and over he says things about the word of God that it, it cannot be broken and... Uh, <laughs> not a jot or tittle of the law is going to fail. Uh, it's all, all to be fulfilled and everything. And he took it as an absolute authority. And, uh, you know, we, we learn a lot from Jesus' example in all this too. Um, Trevor, have you got any comments? Uh, I just had one question uh, in the debate about uh, Bible versions um, because of my interest in archaeology. Any comments, Stephen, on the time frames from the uh, from the uh, Septuagint versus the Masoretic? Because the figures end up quite a big difference. Any comment on that? Uh, you're muted, Steve. Yeah, sorry about that. Look, um, I I know what the Septuagint was translated around about 250, maybe 300 BC uh, at Alexandria by a group of, I think it was 70 elders of the Jews. Um, That's why it's called that Septuagint. Um, And what we know, that even the Dead Sea Scrolls date to about the same time. Look, I, I can't say whether any is more accurate. I just know, of course, in the New Testament, almost all, I think all the Old Testament translations or so old quotations are coming from the Septuagint. So I honestly can't say too much there. I'm just aware of those basic facts. Right. Uh, I think at this stage I will um, uh, stop the recording. So, um, uh, yes, uh, Leonard? Can I make a comment on my talk of two weeks ago? Um, in that, because I'm dealing with several philosophers and going through here, I bought Grayling's History of Philosophy because I wanted an atheist view of all of these people. His book came out 12 years after Sedley's book about creationism and its critics in antiquity. 
It never mentions the creationist debate. Socrates is just an ethicist, and there's no mention of his switch to be switch from ethics to creationism. And yes, yeah, so, and what's the point you're making? Well, you can't. They, they, they often the atheists think that because they're being rational, they're much more neutral on all of this. But 12 years later with this book, he's completely left out the, that entire creationist debate. And the word creation doesn't even exist in his index. Mm. Mm. He's not neutral at all on, the, on that massive debate. Mm. You don't tell me that they're selective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, at this, uh, so I am... Um, I'll just about finish the recording. So, as, uh, but we'll hang on after I stop the recording. Um, so, um, thank you very much, Steve. Um, it's uh, it, it is a, a good summary that you, you kind of highlighted the principles behind it. And so, thank you for all the work you've done. So, I'll just um, stop the recording at this point.